Hello, worms. Warlock is, in my opinion, the easiest class to make a character around. Dragons are the most iconic D&D monster, being, you know, half the title of the game. But are they the most interesting monsters to make adventures around? Not really. So how about we combine them? I'm Antonio D'Amico, this is Pointy Hat, and we're about to do just that in this brand new episode of Drag On Race. <laughs> Yes, it's time for me to mess with dragons a little bit more. If you're new or you need a refresher, this is a series on this channel where I take a dragon, a class, and mash them together until something comes out. A warden dragon. What is a warden dragon, you ask? Well, let me tell you, disembodied voice that sets up segues in the scripts I write. Warden dragons are a pointy hat original monster that was meant as an answer to problems that tend to arise with the baseline D&D dragons. Warden dragons get their power by growing their horde, which in their case is people. So instead of hanging out in the middle of nowhere, not influencing the plot that much, warden dragons tend to be the leaders of massive communities, like universities, gangs, and other groups of people. Warden dragons look very distinct to one another, going with a specific animal motif rather than their main difference being the color of their scales and what Pokemon type they are. And from an actual running the game perspective, Warden Dragons are based on specific D&D classes, and their stat blocks reflect this by having abilities based on the class they were based on, with Mega's Dragons, the Wizard Dragons, being able to cast and learn new spells like Wizards, and Archon Dragons, the Sorcerer kind, their stat block is in that video now, having access to meta magic. So those are Warden Dragons, but if we're gonna go ahead and make a new one, we should look into existing D&D Dragons. And since there are 5,000 of them, and I already made a video with a basic overview, what if we zero in on one? But which one? Uh, it'll do. Okay, Dragon Primer. We're talking about silver dragons. So, silver dragons are silver, and, and they are dragons, and... Wait, why am I doing this? Familiar! Dragon Primer. Now! Hi guys, uh, I, I cut my hair without my permission? Yeah. Uh, whatever. Dragon Primer. Dragon Primer. Silver Dragons. I read a whole bunch about these guys, so... Let's go. Silver dragons are metallic dragons, which means their scales are metal, which means they are good. Why? No correlation. That's just how these guys are set up. As we explained in the original dragon video, dragons in D&D are extremely tied to the alignment rules, which you know the hat loves. So these guys are nice because they're made of jewelry. Good, good. Looks wise, they suffer from what all other D&D dragons suffer. Other than the color of their scales, there's just not much to differentiate these guys. F to all the colorblind warriors in the comments. A big deal is made about how frilly they are, but like, I mean, I guess. Like, 90% of these have frills, but sure. I found somewhere that they smell like rain, which is a weirdly intimate detail that you guys can use for... things? You sickos. A big deal is also made about how smart they are, but the adult one has the exact same intelligence as gold dragons, and as bronze dragons, and as blue dragons. Wow, these guys really are not distinct in the stat block department, huh? Anyway, the text does say that they're particularly smart, so... There's that. An interesting tidbit, though, is that despite being classified as good, they are less of a superhero dragon than gold dragons and other metallic dragons, who apparently are tripping over themselves to help citizens in need, Smallville farm boy style. Silver dragons instead prefer to languish somewhere and be asked to help, which mood, and then when someone does show up, they will proceed to help them, because they're good, because they're metallic. We love character complexity here. Just like we talked about green dragons specifically in the sorcerer dragon video, because they are sort of a twisted mirror of our warden dragons, in that green dragons collect people just for the fun of owning interns. We're going in on silver dragons because they actually prefer the company of people to the company of no company, I guess. <laughs> Dragons just don't tend to hang out much. They repost introvert memes on 2010 Tumblr from their lairs about drinking tea or whatever it is you introverts do. I mean, I wouldn't know. If I don't speak to at least seven people a day, I will wilt and die on the spot. Silver dragons like to take the form of a person, being one of the rare 5e dragons that can actually change into a humanoid form. Many people just believe this is a thing that all dragons can do, but nope, not in 5e. Only a very select number of powerful dragons can do cosplay, and silver dragons are amongst them. They are big into LARPing as people and love to be out there where the people are, Quasimodo style. An interesting distinction here is that this doesn't mean that silver dragons see humanoids as equals. Silver dragons believe themselves to be much better than people, just like other dragons. And just like some articles of clothing I can think of. Stay on task, I don't pay you to sass me. You do not pay me. In my head, how silver dragons see people is very much like a Rose Quartz from Steven Universe type of vibe. They are fascinated by these little hairy animals and their tiny lives like someone studying wildlife is, and they like them enough, but the dragon doesn't see the people they live with as actual peers. Yes, this does conflict with the whole goody two-shoes dragon thing, but if you want to make these guys more interesting, it helps to push that boundary, a little bit at least. 
Okay, so the main difference between Silver Dragons and Warden Dragons is the same difference between Green Dragons and Warden Dragons. They both take an interest in people, but they do not gain power from hoarding them like Warden Dragons do. Silver Dragons don't even hoard people at all. They hoard like relics of humanoid history, like a big lizard Little Mermaid. I want to be where the people are. Humanoids are just their hyperfixation, not the literal source of their power. As a matter of fact, for how much is made about how much Silver Dragons are the socialites of Dragonkind, living in the big city among the humanoid rabble like Gossip Girl Lizards, there's also like a lot of texts about how they live in mountains in the middle of nowhere. It makes it feel like the whole living with humanoids is more like a vacation or weekend activity. Like they own a second residence in the city, but their actual home is in middle of nowhere Colorado. There's even mention of Silver Dragons living amongst other Silver Dragons in clans, so... I don't know, both and neither, I guess. Okay, so talking about combat now, there's not much to differentiate silver dragons from... Like, any other type of dragon? They do have the ability to cosplay a person, but this is less of a combat thing and more of a reveal thing. Like, wow, who could have known that that was a dragon? Their Pokemon type is Ice, and they get two breath weapons instead of one. Chromatic dragons are quaking. The first one is a minty fresh cold breath that does cold damage by freezing enemies. And the second one is a minty fresh cold breath that paralyzes by freezing enemies. That's suspicious. Jury's still out on how these two are different, but they do have different mechanics, so it counts. Silver dragons end up being kind of scary in combat just because if you fail enough saves, you can end up frightened and paralyzed. Real talk, I'm very, very wary of stuff like this. You need to be careful when running stuff like this in combat. D&D is a game where it can take more than five minutes to get to your turn in combat. Nothing feels worse than waiting that long only for you to end up doing nothing because you're stacking up to two or more conditions. Be careful running this. It will feel bad. It will not be a hard fight. It will just be an annoying fight. Oh, and for all the talk about how much these guys love flying, they have the exact same flying speed as any other dragon, so... <laughs> yeah. They do get a wing attack as a legendary action where they basically turn into a helicopter and make people prone by batting their wings around, but... Yep, this is also a thing that all other dragons get. See what I mean when I say these stat blocks are not distinct? So those are silver dragons. They are the dream blood rotation dragon that is not like other dragons because they like to hang out with people, but not too much. They hoard museum pieces of other cultures, British style, because of their hyperfixation. And they use the refreshing taste of five gum as a weapon. Got it. Okay, enough. Primer done. We learned so much. Everybody say thank you to the human familiar. Thank you, human familiar. Now let's get back to actually cooking up our own dragon. So now that we have a clearer understanding on what your normal D&D dragons are, we gotta talk about where you usually find these normal D&D dragons. And that's in dungeons. Dungeon delving is not for the faint of heart, and many an adventurer has delved into a dungeon only to never emerge back to the surface. It almost feels like these are not really just old temples or literal dungeons that have been abandoned and overtaken by monsters. It almost feels like someone, somewhere, designed these to be a challenge for adventurers. Who? Well, you! If you get Delve, a guide to dungeons! That's right, Bob Worldbuilder, fellow YouTuber, and Eventier Games are back, and this time I'm with them! That's right, I contributed to this book. Delve brings you everything you could possibly need to make and run and play dungeons. You know, the first and the good part of Dungeons and Dragons. And Bob has gotten basically every DD YouTuber to help him with this book. Genie D, Dungeon Dad, DD Shorts, a bunch more, and. Moi have contributed their own little ideas to the effort. I made a magic item for it, a hag's cauldron. Nobody's surprised. I'm nothing if not predictable. And it can empower the potions you put in it, provided you and two other friends start brewing it as you cackle around it, you know, for the witch vibes. But the meat of this book is its emphasis on dungeons. I've said before that dungeons are really, really fun, but also very challenging to actually make. And Delve helps a ton with this thanks to their dungeon design toolbox that actually walks you through making traps, hazards, and a bunch of other things. Not only that, but it also just does the work for you with more than, listen up, 10 dungeons that you can just drop into your campaign easily. They call them plug and play for a reason. And if you want stats, I got them. More than 40 monsters, more than 40 traps, hazards, puzzles. And if you thought that this book was only for DMs, you fell into my trap. <laughs> See, it's, it's a thematic joke because... 
it's, it's a book about dungeons. Anyway, there's a ton of subclasses, feats, and species for you players. And all of this is not just 5e. No. The book comes in two versions, one for D&D 5e and one for Shadow Dark RPG. For all of those that prefer Shadow Dark or want to give it a try. So if all of this sounds good, go ahead and click on the very first link in the description of this very video. The Kickstarter is live right now, so no better time than the present to delve into the dungeon. And now that we've talked dungeons and dragons, let's get back to actually cooking up our own dragon. So how do we do our warlock dragon? Well, we use the tried and true pointy hat monster making creation method. We distill the essence of both elements to make a monster that both feels like a warlock and feels like a dragon. I released a video on warlocks not that long ago. Y'all can watch that if you need more of an in-depth look on that. And y'all should because it has a whole warlock subclass for free. And who is the patron of that subclass? Well, a dragon, of course. Warlock patrons are extremely powerful magic things. And isn't it insane that we haven't gotten a dragon warlock patron yet? I'm here to provide that. But what about a dragon that is literally made exactly for that? That's right. I think the best way to make this warlock dragon feel dragon E and warlock E is to approach it from the patron angle. A dragon that makes deals with the members of its horde to keep them trapped as members of its horde. Its spellcasting should also feel connected to warlock's premature ending way of spellcasting. Warlocks have very few spell slots, but they always cast at the highest possible level. So the dragon should embody that too. Cool. We have a direction for this dragon. Let's go ahead and make it. Warden dragons do not reproduce like other dragons. They do not reproduce at all. They select a horde mate as their next incarnation and then pass on their draconic essence, which transforms the chosen horde mate, often called the prince, into a dragon. Patron dragons, the warden dragons associated with warlocks, can only pass on their essence to someone who has already acquired a sufficient amount of their power. A patron dragon builds its horde through contracts. First, they start small, granting a small part of their impossibly powerful magical abilities for smaller, shorter contracts. But magic, like all power, can be addictive. Just as Archon Dragons, the Warden Dragons associated with sorcery, seek out the marginalized and societal outcasts to offer them a sense of community, Patron Dragons specifically seek out the hopeless, those that desperately need power and yet find themselves powerless. It's said that they can literally smell desperation, and that when they strike, they offer a deal that will make all their problems go away, power that the potential Horde mate could only dream of, in exchange for belonging to their Horde. If desperation doesn't push the person to join, their thirst for power will. And soon enough, the Warlock Dragon finds itself with its own horde, and its power grows with it. But a Warlock Dragon must be careful, as their source of power is not infinite. Whereas Sorcerer Dragons radiate power to those around them indiscriminately, Patron Dragons can choose exactly how much power they grant, to what individual, and when to take it away. But whenever they do grant power, that's some of their power that leaves the dragon's body and goes to the Warlocks. They must walk the line between not giving enough of their power and losing their horde, and giving too much power to their warlocks and becoming powerless to defend themselves against outside threats. Some warlock dragons navigate this by fostering a specific feeling among their horde, complete and utter devotion. This is the reason why a warlock dragon's horde is often referred to as a cult. It's not uncommon for the members of a horde of a patron dragon to believe they worship not a dragon, but a god, and for good reason. The patron dragon is able to grant them impossible powers, and just as easily, take them away. These cult-like hordes understand that the only reason they have that power to begin with is because of their contracts, and because the patron dragon allows it. And so, those that seek more power often become almost religious in their devotion towards their patron. Those that show the greatest devotion to their patron will in turn be granted more power, strengthening the horde's resolve to stand with their patron. The Warlock Dragon will then choose a Prince, the Horde Mate that will one day receive the Patron Dragon's Draconic Essence and become the Dragon's successor. The Prince will then receive more and more power from their deal with the Patron Dragon, until the moment where more of the Dragon's power lives within the Prince than within the Dragon. When this happens, the Patron Dragon must be extremely careful, as the Dragon is at its weakest here. It must quickly perform the ritual and pass on its Draconic Essence to its chosen Prince, who will in turn become the new Patron Dragon and inherit the Horde its predecessor built. It is however just as likely for a Patron Dragon to decide that the best course of action is to be transparent with the Horde mates as to how much power they will grant, and for what reason. Patron dragons are known for their ability to smell desperation and for their cult-like hordes, but they're also known for their love of contracts, deals, and fine print. And some desperate people are best used as clients than as warlocks. Proficient in legalese after countless years of drafting contracts, there are many patron dragons that find themselves as leaders of guilds, adventuring guilds, with a horde of highly trained warlock adventurers ready to take on jobs that come to the guild. 
The Patron Dragon grants its horde mates more or less amount of power depending on how hard the job is. Some of these adventuring guilds led by Patron Dragons become world renowned for their efficiency, becoming pillars of their communities, just as long as these communities pay diligently and read the fine print of their contracts associated with the horde's services. How a warlock dragon decides to run its horde, whether it's through cultish devotion or the cold fairness of contract, it is for the patron dragon to decide. I dare say that's a pretty cool dragon! Whereas the sorcerer dragon was basically an arcane nuclear battery that granted power to all of those around them, just like how sorcerer's origins often happen just by being in the general proximity of something particularly magical, patron dragons, on the other hand, are more precise in their magic granting, being able to pick and choose to whom and how much power they grant, but it comes with significant drawbacks. And yep, yeah, you can say what you want, but this thing sure looks different enough from other dragons, and went with sort of a marine theme, because to me warlocks are very octopus coded, but I want wanted to make it feel eldritch enough that you could imagine these guys swimming around or ominously floating through space, Mind Flayer style. I imagine these guys' stat blocks would be all about minions, controlling them in the battlefield and empowering them more than dealing damage directly, although of course they'll be able to do so. Oh, oh my god, what if the Dragon Breath weapon was a buff to the dragon's warlocks instead of a damaging cone against its enemies? That would be sick. And imagine the adventures you can run around these guys. Of course you can go with the cult angle, and god knows you can run a bunch of adventures based on cults, but you could also go with the sort of warlock guild leader angle. What if the party meets a warlock that is part of one of these guilds? And speaking of characters, as I always say, a monster is not a great monster unless it gives you as many options for players as it gives to DMs. So how about we make a player character around the idea of a patron dragon? Agatha is the latest in a long line of a powerful and very rich family. They made their fortune running a particularly influential adventuring guild that has operated for centuries and dominated all other adventuring guilds. How? Because of the patronage of a powerful patron dragon. Agatha's ancestor made the first contract with the first patron dragon, and ever since, descendants of the family have taken on the mantle of the guild, becoming warlocks of the dragon and stewards of the guild. Agatha is next in line and set to make her pact with the patron dragon soon, so that she can become a warlock and part of the guild and the horde. There is just one problem. She hates the patron dragon. Agatha feels her family relies far too much on the dragon, and the dragon has too much power over them. The patron could make her entire family bend to its will with a flick of the wrist, as their entire fortune and future is tied to the dragon's power. She's voiced these concerns to her parents countless times, but they are unrelenting. The night before she's forced to sign her contract, she flees in desperation. She would rather live in destitute poverty and abandon her beloved family than become a thrall to the dragon. And as she runs through the forest outside of the family's estate, that's when the patron dragon appears before her, sensing her desperation. Agatha is terrified of the beast, but she finds enough resolve to explain to the dragon why she won't sign a pact with it, how she would rather be powerless than to give it even more power over her and her family. And that's when the dragon offers her a deal. If Agatha makes a pact with the patron dragon, the patron dragon promises that Agatha will become its prince, the next vessel of its draconic essence. The patron dragon says that its age is getting to it, and it's time to choose a new prince. And that prince could be Agatha, if she proves herself powerful enough to handle its powers. Agatha contemplates this, and sees in this opportunity the freedom she so desperately desired. If she's the next patron dragon, her family will not have to fear for their freedom, and they'll get to keep the immense draconic powers that allow them to run the guild. That night, in the forest outside of the family estate, Agatha signs her pact. She now travels the world honing her magic, receiving more and more warlock powers from her patron. She knows that she needs to become as powerful as possible so that she may receive the draconic essence, the ticket to her and her family's freedom. She just needs to be in chains for a while longer. But is a warden dragon's draconic essence just their power? How much of the dragon's soul is transferred during the ritual to receive its essence? How much of Agatha will be left after the ritual is done? I don't know. You do! If you play Agatha, or make her an NPC, or put her in your campaign in any other way, my brand new subclass you can find in my Warlock video for free, give her high charisma for rich kid upbringing, high dexterity for fancy kid fencing lessons, and just plain bad strength for fun. And presto, you got a draconic warlock with a patron dragon twist. I mean, you would, if, if this patron dragon thing was an actual thing. You would need a stat block for it. And as I said, it needs to feel like a warlock, right? We want it to be distinct. How do you adapt a warlock spellcasting to dragons? And that idea of a breath cone that is used as a buff to a dragon's warlock is cool, but like, what are the mechanics of that? And if this dragon thing uses minions, that probably means lair action, so you gotta come up with those too. Oh boy, have fun, I guess.
Oh no, don't have fun. If your fun is making complicated stat blocks, because I made it for you. <laughs> My evil knows no bounds. And the one for the Sorcerer Dragon is also in its video, sorry for the wait. But what if you want a different dragon? A Sorcerer Dragon, perhaps? Well, here's a video on them, with a stat block in it too. And if you want to learn all there is to learn on Warlocks because you've decided to play one, here's the video on that that I keep referring to, with the subclass I mentioned. Alright, don't make any packs I wouldn't make. Bye! Mwah.